outback Australia, an unforgiving territory, and a land of amazing creatures, where sometimes nature needs a helping hand. These are the everyday heroes bound by a single mission to save wildlife anywhere, anytime. In this episode of Outback Wildlife Rescue... He's quite a big fella and he's quite thoroughly wedged. A feisty frill-necked lizard gets the jump on his rescuers. Tackling the snake that other snakes are scared of. He could quite possibly strike at us. And what problem would bring a tough little turtle to tears? Australia is a massive continent, and its wildlife is as diverse as the landscape. From the tropical Queensland coast to what's called the top end, Darwin and the monsoonal wetlands that surround it. And south through the arid interior to the red deserts of Alice Springs and beyond. The Northern Territory is bird heaven. More than 400 different species, each adapted for its landscape. But when they come into close contact with people, trouble can soon follow. And no one knows that better than the staff at the Ark in Darwin. Yeah. Uh, Looks like it might be covered in engine oil of some description. Yeah, so it smells like it. Okay. It's a young sacred kingfisher. Mm. That's very good. They hunt by perching in branches above mangroves and dive down to grab fish. But this one's mistaken a tray of oil for water. Somebody's changed the oil in their car and they've left a, a tray out on the, on the sort of concrete and this guy's seen it and thought it was a muddy puddle. And it's just gone diving in looking for fish or something and just got saturated. And you can see how it destroys the, the feathers so they're not able to fly. And, and there's a good chance he swallowed some. The chances of this bird surviving are pretty slim. They're pretty stressful and, and fragile at the best of times. We're going to have to um, wash it. The only hope to save this kingfisher is to painstakingly clean each individual feather. But the stress alone could be too much, so it will have to be anaesthetised. Lisa has a huge job ahead with this tiny bird. OK, let's get him on the gas. Come on, baby. At Biwa in southeast Queensland, the Australian Wildlife Hospital has its hands full too. Like the Ark, they never know what's coming through the door next. Turns out it's a green sea turtle found near a local wharf. The rescue team just um, picked her up and brought her in. Apparently she's been um, floating with the back end up. Can't dive. A floating turtle. So, of course, they've called her Bob. But it's a serious problem. If she can't dive, she can't feed and would soon die. Vet Amber Gillett needs to get to the bottom of what's making Bob, Bob. Little turtle. You're quite bright, aren't you? You can just hold him up and I'll have a look under his belly. Green sea turtles can grow to more than a metre and a half long. They're vegetarian, which is unique among sea turtles. And eating all that seagrass gives their skin a green tinge, from which they get their name. I'm just going to collect some blood from this turtle. It's very routine for us to take bloods from all of them that come in. It just can be quite challenging getting blood from a turtle. They, they don't have any external veins that you can see. Sea turtles can't draw their heads inside their shells. So to protect against predators, the skin there is really tough. It makes taking a sample tricky. I'll just let him settle down again, guys. Poor little thing. It's terrible having needles jabbed into your neck all day. Aha, here we go. Finally, success. But under the microscope, 
The blood's not answering any questions. Um, she's slightly anemic and she certainly has uh, low protein in their blood. We, we think it might be because they haven't been eating for such a long time. Um, so it'll take a little while yet until we find out what's wrong with her. Bob's case is still a mystery, but they're determined to get to the bottom of it. Three hundred kilometres south of Darwin in Catherine, David Reed's a bit of a local hero. He's the guy people call when wildlife needs rescuing, and Reedy loves all creatures, but he has his favourite. Snakes, they're my main fascination, uh, and everything about them, how they move, how they eat, uh, how you can get around with no legs, and just how they've evolved to that, and how they're so successful. Reedy's in the right place. Catherine's home to some of the world's most deadly snakes, and it's a rare day when he's not called out to catch one. Today, Paddy's been on the phone. How are you, Paddy? Very well, thanks. I'll be with you in one second. I'll just get a bag. You got the snake? I have. Well, I hope I have anyway. It's still there, I think. All right. Okay. We'll see if we can get him out, out of your way. Right, yeah. This shed over here? Yeah, or? yeah, over here. All yeah. right. We'll see what we can find. Might be still there. Hopefully it's still there. Of course he's still there. Paddy's grandson's been watching him like a hawk. So where is he, Paddy? Just, just oh. in there. Just yeah. Have you got a light so yeah. I can just see yeah, what I'm doing? Or? <laughs> Push it in as you turn it on. Thank you. This snake is one of the outback's top predators. The one other snakes are scared of. And Reedy has to catch him. What we're going to do is going to knock him out so that we can get really good access to all his feathers without stressing him too much. The tiny rescue is underway at the Ark in Darwin. A young kingfisher has dived into engine oil. His chances of survival are slim, but Lisa's going to try to save him. She'll need to clean each feather with detergent. A bit like a cat that licks itself, the bird preens and it strips all the oils and things off its feathers to keep the feathers really clean. So every time he does that, he's um, swallowing that oil that he's stripping off. Um, so without the removal of that oil, he doesn't have any hope at all. I'm going to use this lovely warm mixture and see if we can't remove some of the oil. Sacred kingfishers are found throughout Australia's coastal regions. This one isn't quite fully grown. It's such a tiny, tiny little thing. Their plumage is a spectacular blue-green colour, but that's hidden now under the oil. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm getting into all the little tight spots where the oil will be laid in underneath the layers of feathers. I'm trying to do it in such a way that I don't disrupt the feathers or damage the feathers in any way. Um, the, the oil's already going to strip, um, you know, the coating and stuff off them. Sometimes people think animals are expendable and that we'll have them for, forever and it doesn't really matter, but at the end of the day, um, it's us that it's going to miss out. His breathing saying. is becoming quite shallow. He's starting to react to the anaesthetic. It's time to bring him round. But now the gas is off, the kingfisher's not waking up. Come on, little fella. Can you come back to the land of the living? Amber's still trying to get to the bottom of why Bob, the green sea turtle, was found bobbing in the ocean. She's taken x-rays and they finally reveal the answer. So this is the x-ray of the sea turtle. That's the edge of the shell. Um, this is the edge of the lungs in here. And there's this black space which indicates there's gas sitting free in the salomic cavity there. The salomic cavity is the gap between the body wall and the internal organs. Right now, Bob's is full of gas and it shouldn't be. Apparently this turtle, when they found it in the water, was trying to dive and, and the 
back end was sort of bobbing up again, which would indicate there's got to be gas in there somewhere that keeps it to the surface. There can be a few reasons for that. One can be a boat strike and they get a damaged lung and the lung actually leaks into the slomy cavity. She hasn't really got any evidence of trauma, but there is a small penetrating wound just underneath the plastron, which could have been a barnacle that has died and, and um, you know, gone elsewhere. And that's just left a little bit of a hole for gas to escape into. Maybe Bob's gas was caused by an injury, but it can also happen through infection or swallowing plastic bags. Whatever the cause, the treatment's the same. They have to suck the gas out. We pretty much aim to go in front of the flipper here. This is very bouncy. There's quite a lot of air sitting in there. So this is where the fun starts. Um, taking a lot of air out of turtles. I've sometimes taken five litres out of large ones. So it's usually quite a long and notoriously boring process, but it helps them a lot. They feel a lot more comfortable after it. Bob's in for a long afternoon. The tiny kingfisher is still fighting for life. Yeah, he's still breathing. He's just very faintly. He's still got a heartbeat. He's starting to get a little bit of reflex. But he's not really sure he wants to come back to this world. Pure oxygen should help revive him. Certainly getting a little bit responsive. I'm happy I can see his breathing. Um, I can see he's got a bit of reflex. Um, he did have his eye open a little bit before and then he decided he didn't really want to wake up just yet. Um, but I still would like him to be a little bit more awake a little bit more quickly. He's still alive, so I've got to be happy about that. Well, you can see he's starting to wake up. He's just not quite. Oh, there he is. That's it. You feel better now? Hey, does that feel better? Oh, you're still all soggy though, aren't you, darling? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. If nothing else, the kingfisher is a fighter. He's not giving up. He's not as clean as I would like him to be, but he's looking a little bit better. You can see his colours and things now. Hopefully over the next few days we'll be able to get him finished, cleaned up, and um, if he gets through that, then we'll be able to release him. Release still seems a long way away, but he's in with a chance. OK, we're going to put him into a hospital box. Um, it's nicely ventilated, but it's quite dark in there. So we're going to leave him here in the quiet and the dark um, and come back and visit him in a little while and see how he's going. OK, little fella. Come on, then. In Outback Catherine, Reedy's got a snake to deal with. A black-headed python. No prizes for guessing how they get their name. So what he's doing there, uh, he's in a bit of a threat posture. So he feels a little bit cornered. Uh, he's just moving sideways, showing his bands uh, and flicking his tongue pretty fast and pretty often. So uh, he's letting us know he's there. And if we come any closer, uh, he could quite possibly strike at us. Black-headed pythons are common hereabouts. They'll often just poke that black head out of their burrow. It absorbs enough heat from the sun to warm their whole body. They're near the top of the food chain, because while they're not venomous, they eat snakes that are, and have become immune to poisonous bites that would kill humans. And with 70 jagged little teeth, they can deliver a nasty nip of their own. All this is doing, uh, black-headed pythons are a big bluff snake. So what he's trying to do uh, is just sort of scare me away. And you can see he had a bit of a lunge, uh, which is a sort of a very feeble uh, strike attempt. He's done that. His mouth has been open, uh, but not all the way. He's only just done that uh, to try and scare me away. And his next movement was, you know, to try and run away or try and move. So uh, just a bit of a threat response. Uh, doesn't really want to hurt me, just wants to let me know he's there uh, and get out of my way or I might hurt you next time. Never attempt to catch a snake yourself. It's dangerous. Reedy makes it look easy, 
but he's a professional and he's also a bit of a snake ambassador. After a rescue, he makes a point of explaining to folks what's special about these guys. It's all right, he won't hurt you, don't have to run away. Yeah, he is. So he's getting on close to an adult size. So black headed pythons uh, get to around a little bit over two metres. So, uh, and this guy all the way stretched out, uh, probably be about sort of 1.8 metres. So he's getting uh, pretty old. Snakes grow pretty uh, slow in the wild. They're opportunistic feeders. Uh, and at this size, they might only eat a couple of times a year. So, Is that all? yeah. This python was probably keeping poisonous snakes away. But everyone will still be better off if Reedy finds him a new home. Taking away from the kids and Paddy so they don't have to worry about him, uh, but we're also saving the snakes. So we can take him out into the bush, relocate him, uh, and let him live a happy and safe life. There's a reptile in trouble in Darwin too. Stephen and Lisa are on the case. We just got a call about this chronic lizard. It's been wedged here in the in, in this cyclone mesh fence for, for a little while. There you go. The frill neck lizard's frill has been his downfall. He's managed to get himself halfway through this fence. Shame about the other half. He's quite a big fella and he's quite thoroughly wedged, so um, we're going to have to have to cut the cut the wire. Frillnecks are found across Australia's northern third. This one is pretty much full grown. Now he's free, here's a lesson in lizard handling. First, the hiss is just bluff. He's trying to scare you off. The frill's just for show too. Makes him look bigger comes out when he opens his mouth wide. And when those two fail, he'll jump. And then there's plan D. Run like crazy. <laughs> Up a tree might have been a better long-term option. But some lizards. Hey. <laughs> yeah, idiot. Well, they're just best left alone. In Biwa, Amber thinks she's just about got Bob's gas sorted. So we've got about 1,800 mils on one side and about 800 on the other side. So we're actually more than two litres on this turtle. About two and a half litres we got off just then. I don't know if you, you can notice the difference, but if I pick her up this side, you see this isn't as springy anymore. It's really quite sunken in now. It's, it's not as bouncy like a balloon. So she's feeling much better. Okay. I think we'll give her some antibiotics, Joe, and then take her outside. With the gas out, Bob should be on the road to recovery, but it won't happen overnight. Um, as you can see, he's still floating a little bit. Um, it's not going to be uh, perfectly back to normal just after sucking out all the air. Um, sometimes the gas can refill a bit. They'll keep a close eye on Bob over the next few days, but if the quick fix doesn't work, she could be calling this pool home for a long time to come. At the Ark in Darwin, Lisa's checking on the little kingfisher she worked so hard to save. Um, the little kingfisher that we were washing yesterday has not made it through the night, unfortunately. We've come in this morning and um, he's vomited up all the oil. We're worried about him having ingested too much oil. And you can see the amount of stuff that he spewed up there is, you know, a lot for a very little bird, so... It's a sad little reminder that no matter how hard they try, not every animal can be saved. 
I guess I still didn't hold much hope for him, um, but that doesn't mean that you don't, don't become attached to something. And you do, you hope. You put a lot of hope into to everything that you do and um, I think every time something dies, you kind of wrecks you a little bit some, sometimes. Yeah. Reedy's about to release that black-headed python. He's picked a spot with a million dollar view and a perfect habitat. Black-headed pythons love a rocky environment. Uh, this sort of habitat is ideal for this species. Uh, lots of nice places to hide uh, and a lot of food to eat. The python's one of the top predators around here. So chances are, he'll soon find some poor animal's burrow to take over and live in. And while he's looking, He's well equipped to stay hidden from any dingoes that might hunt him. The other distinguishing feature uh, with this snake uh, is actually the bands that continue along the whole length of the body. Uh, what that allows the snake to do is get some nat natural camouflage uh, and blend in. There's actually quite a big storm coming in behind us, uh, so we'll let the snake go quickly. He'll probably uh, find a place, a rock or a little cave or crevice to hide up in, uh, and he'll stand out the storm in there. Snake's now happy, he's got a nice new environment to settle into. Uh, he's nice and safe, away from people, no one to bother him, and hopefully he can live out the rest of his life here. It's been a week since Bob the green sea turtle had gas cleared from inside her shell. Good news is, She's not bobbing anymore. She's quite bright. She's very active for a turtle that's been floating for a long time. She's looking quite good. Amber's given the all clear for Bob to go home, and the hospital's release team has called in. Briano and Kate will round Bob up and ship her out. There's Bob. Well, she's great. She's really, um, really active. Good work. Up. Yeah. We're gonna take it in hospital. Yeah. Okay. Good work. The hospital tags its departing patients to keep track of their progress in case they ever wash up here again. One of our turtles returned to us three times, so it was good to know that it actually was her. So by microchipping and tagging, it's sort of double protection. They'll always retain the microchip or the tag so we can identify them when they come back into care, which is kind of great. You know, we hope they don't come back in, but when we do, we know who they are, which is good for us. Little Bob. Little Bob. Little Bob. <laughs> oh, I got a little earring there. All done. <laughs> a little earring. To give Bob the best chance of not coming back again, she's being taken a couple of miles offshore to deep, turtle-friendly water. Bob's freely diving now around the pools um, back at the rehab centre, so he's doing, going to be doing really well out here. Guy, he's ready to go. See you, buddy. Got taken a nice big dive, probably right down at the bottom to check out what's happening, see if there's any other turtles around, and then find his way around where he wants to live. Almost all of the reasons that wildlife comes into our care is because of things that people have done. If I can help get some of those creatures back into the wild and help sort of restore some of the balance, you know, that's great. Every time it just blows me away. Here we are, we've managed to return this animal back to where it belongs. What better thing can you hope for?